The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's message begins with an embarrassing admission. The longer I study scripture, the more perplexed I am by certain passages within it. Yes, after 43 years of serving the church, 34 of those as an ordained pastor, I think I actually know less than what I used to. Now, that's really not true. I mean, rather, it's more that I've matured as a pastor. I've grown up quite a bit as a pastor from the days when I had to convince people that I was an expert on such things. I mean, after all, there's a lot of pressure on the preacher to explain scripture in a rather coherent way manner, but always beware of the preacher that knows it all. Always be suspicious of the pastor that has it all figured out with precise clarity as if God and faith were some sort of puzzle to solve. Because the longer I'm a pastor, the greater awareness I have of what it is I don't know. Now it's very freeing to finally admit that a lot of what I used to teach and preach, while I was very sincere, probably included a few smoke and mirrors designed to support the illusion that I knew far more than I really did. Now this is for me a wonderful thing. Maybe not so much for you, especially after hearing today's gospel lesson. If you expect that I'm going to be able to sum it up in 12 minutes or so to give you some keen theological insight into the passage that will allow you to move back into your life with greater faith acuity, there to manage your days in an even more highly effective manner. I mean, after all, what good is faith if it doesn't lead us to become more highly developed and productive human beings? Well, instead, I've learned to admit my confusion at some of the things I discover in the Bible, to admit that faith really is a matter of trusting in God without always knowing. And here's the best part to recognize the grand, unfathomable mystery of God's love for me, for you, and for all of creation. A mystery bigger than my imagination can comprehend. And so it should come as no surprise that I don't have it all figured out. I am as often confused about life and faith as you may be, and I too am doing my best to move about a highly anxious landscape in a culture with enormous problems, in a physical body that isn't always my friend, 
and in a church that is far more human than I'd like it to be. And so I'm grateful for those of you who come to me as your pastor, who, who aren't looking for easy answers to your faith questions, but those of you who come to me willing to wrestle with the questions of faith and to be grateful that even in the midst of things we do not know, that we still have each other and that we are not alone. And to speak out loud what we all need to hear, God is present, God is with you, you are loved. So in this third trimester of my life and of my pastoral vocation, may my sermons become less expository as if the professor is lecturing to his students and may they be more like real-time wrestling matches, times when we go to the mat with God and we experience what it means to be in God's presence and to be in each other's presence too. Maybe we walk away with more questions than answers, wondering even more deeply about the mystery that is faith, but at least we don't walk away alone. And so, Let's look at today's gospel lesson and avoid the temptations of interpreting this gospel lesson, the first of which is to soften its demands. Now let me give you a few examples of how we have done that in the past. Take probably the one verse that sticks out the most, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Well, an ancient scribe added words to make it read how hard it will be for those who trust in wealth not just those who have wealth, but those who trust in their wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now that's the King James Version. And if, if the problem highlighted, it says if the problem highlighted by the rich man is not being rich, but putting his faith in the wealth that he has or craves. Now we've all heard it said, the problem isn't money, but what? The love of money. Well, Jesus would probably disagree and speaks quite plainly about the real obstacles that wealth often presents. And then we've all heard about that camel going through the eye of the needle. Well, a ninth century interpreter made up the idea of this low gate into Jerusalem, the eye of the needle through which camels could pass only if they stooped down and without carrying a lot of things on their back. Well, presumably then, Jesus criticizes only the proud rich or only the rich who are not weighed down by their wealth. Unfortunately, no such eye of the needle gate ever existed. It was made up. Sorry. Other preachers have told us Jesus somehow perceives that wealth is this particular man's special weak spot. And so Jesus wants to zero in on it only to expose the man's shortcoming. Well, this gives us permission to assume that Jesus would not ask us to part with our possessions. Maybe just those things that we are overly attached to. And you've heard this one too. Jesus only tests the man by issuing an impossible demand meant to expose the futility of a self-striving piety. The man has sincerely said, I've kept all these commandments. Therefore, Jesus must expose his hypocrisy. But such an interpretation intends to make a fool out of this man. But not just that. It makes a mockery of Jesus' love for the man. If all Jesus is trying to do is to humble him, then after this man is completely deflated and walks away with his head hanging down, why doesn't Jesus chase after him saying, now wait, here comes the good part. Let me show you God's grace now. Jesus' explanation is rather clear. Just as large animals simply do not fit through tiny openings, so the wealth they do not fit in the kingdom of God. Even a rich man who has successfully kept all the Ten Commandments as this devout man has, cannot get in. And the bottom line, in that this is indeed a shocking text for us, and we do better not to soft pedal it, but rather after our initial intimidation by it, begin to hear it for what it really might be saying. Maybe there are some nuances for us to consider. Now, this is the only time in Mark's gospel that Jesus makes such a demand about possessions. <clears throat> there are other places, like in chapter 8, and even here in this reading, 
where we are invited to lose our very lives, <coughs> excuse me, or to leave house or home or even family for the sake of the gospel. Now, according to Mark's gospel as well, wealth and its deceptions are not the only things capable of choking the word of God out of our lives, cares of the world, lure of wealth. When's the last time you fantasized about winning the lottery? Even desire for other things can sidetrack the life of faith. Being rich is not the unforgivable sin. Perhaps neither is it an entirely unscalable obstacle. But Jesus' primary call is a call to a life of discipleship, or as I like to say, a call to a deeper experience of life's fullness. It's not a call to a life of poverty, but it is a call into a very radically different lifestyle that what, than what the world would offer us. Remember the lesson says, Jesus looking at this man loved him. He's not scolding him, but he's rather calling him to an, into a deeper realization of what it means to be a follower of God. Did the man get it? He walks away in shock and grief, dejected. Jesus was calling him, him into something more. But like so many of us, we can't let go of what we know in order to embrace that which we do not know. Know too that in Jesus' day and time, people viewed the wealthy as specially blessed by God. Remember in the Old Testament, heroes who were blessed with goats and cattle and land and, and children and generations and all sorts of other prosperity. And so the disciples are shocked when Jesus says that the wealthy can't make it into the kingdom of God because the wealthy were considered God's favorites. And so they gasp. Then who, who can make it into the kingdom of God? Who can be saved? If Jesus has categorically ruled out the rich, then can anyone make it in? In other words, Jesus stuns us by putting the kingdom of God so far out of reach. By contrast, though, he says that all things are possible for God. Now, could this be liberation? For if there's no way to hit the target, why not free ourselves up of trying so hard? <coughs> well, notice, Jesus does not tell the man merely to separate himself from his possessions, to burn them, to walk away from them. He goes a step further. He instructs the man to redistribute his wealth among the poor. Jesus calls for more than a change in the man's bottom line and more than a permanent relinquishment of his acquisitions. He tells him to change his relationship to the poor, to help them, to identify with them, an invitation to surrender more than his possessions, but also his status and his power. Well, might this radical call of faith draw us to identify with those on the margins, those who go without, those who for whatever reason have no power, no voice, the invisible, the untouchables, undesirables. You know, Mother Teresa not only helped the poor, she lived among them, became as one of them. In other words, what is it that prevents us from identifying with the marginalized, from being with them? You may have known oppression, but your experience of it should not bring you entitlement. It should move you to compassion to be with and help others who know oppression. In contrast to the wealthy man, Let's look at Jesus' disciples, you know, despite the fact that they seem clueless most of the time as they move through the Gospels, they have already renounced much of their lives. They've left their nets, remember? They walked away from their families with only the sandals on their feet and barely a change of underwear. And yet Peter, in the lesson, still panics. Jesus speaks to him about a new community with its own benefits, a community marked by caring for one another, the same kind of community of care that Jesus asked the rich man to promote by giving his wealth to the poor. And yet even in this community, there are persecutions that accompany such a lifestyle as if it were not difficult enough on its own. A life of authentic discipleship will be countercultural and many people will not like you, but they will not like how you act. Maybe then this passage is not about calling us away from something like wealth. 
It's about calling us into something more. The rich man's story and Jesus' remarks remind us that this radical call of faith will always rankle our deeply ingrained instincts towards self-preservation and security. Jesus does not try to deprive the rich man of his money and power. He asks for more. He tries to claim the man's very own self. Another way to say it, the Christian life is not about giving up everything. It's about recognizing that in our hanging on to some things, we keep ourselves fixed in the shallow end of the pool of life. There is more to swim in, Jesus says, but we're afraid if we venture out, we'll drown. All this Jesus does out of love. He recognizes that there is so much right now for you and for me that prevents us from being fully free, fully who God wants us to become, fully authentic human beings, but we refuse to let go. And in our refusal, we remain stunted in our spiritual growth and less available to the beauty of life that surrounds us. Maybe we are like this man. He was receptive. He went seeking Jesus sincerely. He's not arrogant. He's not self-righteous. He is a deeply religious person so well attuned to his spiritual practices that he can sense that there is more out there than what he has experienced so far. And so he asks Jesus about the more. Is that not the simple question with which we come to church? Is there more to life than what meets the eye? At least our presence here would suggest we haven't given up hope. The man asks, what do I need to add to my life so that I can experience this more? He wants to take the next step and Jesus says, it's not by adding anything that you experience life's fullness. Rather, it's about what you are willing to give up, to let go of, or a shocking realization of what you are not able or willing to give up. As the Message Bible says, The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear from Jesus. And he walked away with a heavy heart because he was holding on tightly to a lot of things and not about to let go. I cry myself blue in the face as your pastor, talking to you about our greatest resistance in life, our resistance to transition, Life is movement, dynamic, constantly changing, and we are fixated and too damn stubborn to go along with it. We hang on to what we know as if in the letting go of certain things, we will lose our very self. Jesus' words make no sense to us. Let go of your life, Jesus says, and you will find it. And we say, Jesus, I don't understand. I don't get it. And so I say to you, What must make me sound like a broken record? It must be for you very annoying, but the radical call of faith is to be ready at any moment to let go of who you are in order to embrace that which you do not know. It is the call of ministry for us to do the same, to trust that God's spirit is still shaping us as a faith community, that things will and do change, that certain people will come and go and new faces will show up at our door. May we never hang on too tightly to this ministry, that it cannot breathe and grow and become and develop, discovering more and more of its true purpose, moving closer and closer to its divine essence. To be ready at any moment, to let go of certain things, and sometimes certain persons, in order for us to become something else, something more, something deeper. Today's gospel lesson is untamable. It resists simple explanations and denies loopholes, making us so uncomfortable that we are liable to talk circles around it in hope of softening its message. But the gospel intends to be experienced rather than than explained. Experienced not in a simplistic manner, but in a way that keeps us focused in the real life demands of discipleship, in the challenging realities of being a new faith community and always on the foundational promise that God makes all things possible. Amen.